Thank you all for coming tonight to the UI Explorers Lecture Series. Um, our tonight's lecture will be by Dr. Nancy Budd, professor in the Department of Geoscience. Um, along with her position here at the university, she is also a research assistant at the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian Institution. Her research focuses on coral paleontology with regards to coral evolution and paleoecology, where her work takes her to many exciting research localities, such as the Dominican Republic. And tonight, she will be talking about one of her current research topics, coral reef conservation, in the talk entitled, Sustaining the Biodiversity of Coral Reefs, Why Evolution Matters. So thank you for speaking tonight. Our understanding of evolution of corals has changed radically in, in recent years. And these changes have important implications for marine conservation, um, specifically the protection of coral reefs, uh, which are currently endangered. Uh, as, uh, uh, some of the new developments that have been occurring are uh, the result of analyses of molecular data, and they have caused those of us um, that work in the fossil record to go back to our data and um, rethink it. Our data, of course, is morphologic data. In other words, the form and structure of um, organisms. And this slide gives an example of that. Here on the left, you can see brain corals. Um, first, Atlantic Deploria on top, and Pacific Platygyra on the bottom. And you can see that they have similar valley shapes, which have um, caused uh, systematists in the past to think that they're very closely related. However, molecular data suggests that they're not related at all. And that has prompted me and some of my colleagues to go and look more closely at these individual partitions that make up the um, valleys. And by looking more closely at these partitions, you can see that they're, they're quite different in terms of their shape, shapes and sizes and, and um, so on. The bumps that occur across them are quite different in um, Atlantic Deploria than Pacific Platygyra. OK. So the work that I'm going to present today, um, I have many colleagues um, who've worked together with me on this project. First, with regard to morphologic data, I've been working with Jarek Stolarski at the Polish Academy of Science. With regard to molecular data and analyses, um, Hiro Fukami and Nancy Knowlton have collected the molecular data and analyzed them for me. And Nate Smith at the University of Chicago, who many of you may know, um, has been helping me with the comparisons between morphological data and molecular data. Uh, John Pandolfi has been helping with um, field work and also with the implications for marine conservation. The talk today has three parts. First, I'll present a general overview of coral biology. Then I'll talk about the evolution of higher taxonomic levels, families, genera, and so on. And then I'll wrap up with the evolution of species, and I'll talk about how um, our new results with regard to the evolution of higher taxonomic levels and the evolution of species are important for um, marine conservation towards the end. So just as an introduction, tropical coral reefs are the most diverse of all marine habitats with estimates of species numbers ranging from one to nine millions. Some estimate that as many as a third of all marine species live on coral reefs, and they've been commonly referred to as the um, tropical rainforest of the sea. R coral reefs occur in, across the globe in tropical regions. Uh, they're restricted to shallow locations with limited sedimentation, low nutrients, and good circulation. And all these red dots on the map indicate um, places where coral reefs are recorded. Uh, they are built by stony corals, or reef corals, or sometimes they're referred to as sclerotinian corals. These are the individuals consist of these cylindrical shaped structures. Um, and with the central mouth surrounded by tentacles. And those that build reefs tend to be colonial. 99% of them are colonial and live in colonies such as this one. Uh, the colonies, the members of the colonies are um, functionally and morphologically identical. 
However, I should point out that these organisms are highly phenotypically plastic. In other words, they change their morphology in response to the environment. And um, so their morphology is highly variable as well. In terms of feeding, corals capture zooplankton at night using tentacles, and that's shown over here on the left. All these white blobs are nematocysts, which they use to um, paralyze prey with, and then they bring the prey into the central mouth. Um, the corals are, tend to be retracted during the day. Here's a retracted one over here. They harbor lots of different types of symbionts, and the most famous of all their um, symbionts are dinoflagellate algae that are um, referred to as zooxanthellae. The zooxanthellae live in the endodermal tissue, shown here. Um, these are the yellow uh, blobs shown in that um, diagram of the tentacle. Essentially, the uh, zooxanthellae photosynthesize, and as a, as a result of their photosynthesis, they remove waste from the coral, and the coral is thereby able to calcify much more rapidly and build huge skeletons. And this is, next slide shows a huge skeleton that corals, it, build essentially the skeletons form the framework of reefs and they're well preserved in the fossil record so we have a nice long evolutionary history of um, corals. As this slide shows the bulk of a coral colony is skeleton, the soft tissue is only a thin veneer on the surface. In terms of reproduction, corals are also very, very simple. Many are hermaphroditic, in other words, they um, produce both sperm and eggs, and they exhibit two types of reproductive strategies, broadcasting in which the gametes, both sperms and eggs, are, um, are uh, released into the water column, and there's external fertilization. They also engage, some of them do, in brooding, in which um, the eggs are retained within the cylinderon, in other words, in the central body cavity. Uh, many, as it says at the bottom of the slide, many broadcasting species release um, egg and sperm that are bundled together, as shown above, and engage in mass spawning events. Because of the mass spawning events, um, the possibility for uh, hybridization exists, but the extent to which hybridization exists is still unclear. And I'll talk lots more about hybridization as we move through the lecture. Corals um, have a free swimming larval stage um, in which they disperse. And as it says here, in some species, larvae settle near their parents and others. They disperse more than hundreds of kilometers. As a result of this um, wide dispersal, endemism is rare, and uh, dispersal essentially enhances gene flow and um, connectivity amongst populations. OK. Uh, the ongoing demise of coral reefs has been very much in the news. Here are a number of different journals showing corals in trouble. Uh, as it says in this slide, estimates assembled through experts' opinions of 372 coral reef scientists and managers from 96 countries are that the world has effectively lost 19% of the original area of coral reefs already. 15% are seriously threatened with loss within the next 10 to 20 years, and 20% are under threat of loss in the next uh, 20 to 40 years. Some of my colleagues says, think that's not too bad because that means that their 40% will be left to protect. Okay. Uh, the main threats to corals include things like um, global warming, ocean acidification, uh, pollution, both the nutrients and other types of pollutants, and overfishing. One thing that we've seen more commonly throughout the globe is coral bleaching. Um, this is a breakdown of symbiosis and the loss of zooxanthellae, and it results in white colored colonies. These colonies are actually still alive, but at, they need to regain their zooxanthellae after a few days or else they'll die. As it says here at the bottom, the link between increased greenhouse gas, gases, climate change, and regional scale bleaching of corals, considered dubious by many reef researchers only 10 to 20 years ago, is now incontrovertible. So um, global warming is. is um, taking its toll. Also important are things like overfishing, where essentially we've lost a lot of the top levels of the food web, and um, once we start losing top levels of the um, food web, uh, 
coral reefs start to collapse. The first stage they go through is fish-dominated herbivory, then echinoid-dominated herbivory, until finally they're completely collapsed and you just have a macroalgal bloom. Okay, so how can um, evolution contribute to uh, conservation measures to protect corals? So like I said, the second part of this talk is about the evolution of higher taxa, families, genera, and so on. And the last part will be about the evolution of species. So this is the beginning of the middle part. Corals belong, in terms of their systematics, to the phylum Cnidaria class. With, and within the uh, phylum Cnidaria, the class Anthozoa. And within the class Anthozoa, the order Scleractinia. The phylum Cnidaria is characterized by radial symmetry. Um, central mouth surrounded by tentacles, two different body forms. There's a polyp body form and a medusa body form. Uh, but more important, they only have two germ cell layers, and so they're very, very simple organisms. Uh, and they also all have nematocysts along their tentacles. There are three classes. The class Anthozoa is distinguished as being exclusively marine polypoid cnidarians, including sea anemones, scleractinian corals, tube anemones, sea pens, sea fans, and so on. There are 14 orders. Six are hexacorals. In other words, the uh, scepter arranges in cycles of six. And in, uh, eight are octocorals. In other words, their scepter or mes mesenteries are arranged in cycles of eight. The order Scleractinia is a uh, hexacoral, and it is distinguished solely by having a calcareous skeleton. Uh, over the years, especially recently, people have questioned whether the order Scleractinia is actually a monophyletic group. Um, monophyly meaning a group composed of an ancestor and all of its descendants. And different studies have, um, have given different answers to this question. I show this, this particular study because it suggests that the Scleractinia indeed are a monophyletic group. Um, this analysis, this tree here, is a result of analyzing several different types of molecular data and also morphology, 16S, 18S, 28S, and um, morphology. And here you can see the six hexachoral orders. Um, the order Scleractinia is down at the bottom and it forms a monophyletic group. Here is the Corallomorpharia, Antipatheria, and so on. But each of the six orders um, of the anthozoan hexachorals um, appear to be monophyletic in this analysis. Uh, and it says here they're all monophyletic, Corallomorpharia being most closely related to the Scleractinia. Okay. This is um, a, the traditional tree of the order Scleractinia. So I've told you a little bit about the phylum, uh, the class, the order, and now I'm moving down to um, subdivisions within the order Scleractinia. And this is the traditional phylogenetic tree. It was constructed a long, long time ago by um, Vaughan and Wells in 1943 and Wells in 1956. And it was actually based on lots of 19th century works and a synthesis also of, of early 19, or 18th century, no, 19th century works and early 20th century works um, is what it's based on. Uh, and today, people that are engaged in marine conservation still use this classification when they're determining um, the, the status of different types of corals. So in this tree, you can see that there are five columns. There's one here, there's one there, three, four, five. These are the five suborders. And there are 33 families. These are all these slanted names. Um, there have been some modifications since this original classification was created, uh, but they're just minor. Varen, for example, recognized seven suborders instead of five. But as I say, they're just minor. This is the, the main framework. And it's based on skeletal morphology. These are the traditional features that um, play prominently in scleractinian classification. First are the corallites within colonies. These are the individuals within a colony and how well they're integrated. Second are the septa. These are the radial radially arranged vertical partitions within a corallite. These are these structures here. Um, Costi are extensions of septa beyond the wall. The columella is a central axial structure that runs down the corallite. The wall is a vertical structure enclosing a corallite. And the synostium or paratheca is a skeleton between 
um, Coralites. With regard to suborders of um, Scleractinia, these are based on traditional models of septal growth. So these are the radiating partitions within a Coralite that I showed in the last slide. And you can see that these are built by discrete rods that are termed trabeculae. And um, on the, essentially, on the upper septal margins, there are teeth, which are shown here. This is dentation. The teeth may be formed by a single tra trabecula or a trabecula fan. So these sorts of things, the arrangements of these rods, um, how they're related to teeth on the upper surface, um, are how suborders were originally distinguished. And here is a molecular analysis, one of the original ones uh, examining these different suborders. And it's based on 16S RNA. Um, here, there are representatives of seven um, suborders. These are the Varin suborders. And what you can see from this is that the suborder Archaeocyana occurs both in the upper clade and in the lower clade. The suborder of Fungina occurs both in the upper and the lower main clade. And the suborder Favina is all over the place. So in other words, they're not monophyletic groups. Um, and I can continue on down. Instead of this seven-fold suborders, and what we're seeing today is a distinction between robust and complex corals. And so these are two major lineages that were never uh, recognized before until um, molecular analyses found them. OK. So I've told you a little bit about the fact that the suborders are not monophyletic. Now I want to move down the um, Linnaean hierarchy and tell you a little bit about families and um, genera. This is a tree that was uh, produced by my colleague um, Hiro Fukami. And in it, we were looking at the families within the, su the traditional suborder Favina. Um, there are seven families in this. And the Favidae are in black. I know you can't read these things, but the colors are what you're supposed to be looking at. Favidae are in black. They're all over the place. Musidae are in blue. They're all over the place. The Marilinidae are here and there. The Pectinidae are there and there. Trichophilidae are embedded within this larger clade. Uh, there's the Meandrinidae, which is the one monophyletic group shown on this particular diagram. And then there's um, the Oculinidae. So the, not only are the suborders in trouble, but also the families are in trouble. And if we look at um, genera, this is the genus Favia. It is scattered across the tree. And my favorite genus, the genus Montastria, is also scattered across the tree. So there are problems at all of the higher levels with regard to traditional classification. Instead, what we see in this tree is that there are three major clades. There is a clade that is restricted to the Atlantic, and this clade was never, ever discovered before. And then there are two clades that are um, in the Pacific. One of them ha contains only Pacific corals. And this one, the second one, con contains a mix of Pacific corals and extinct Atlantic corals. So. Um, essentially find a completely different structure than traditional classification led us to believe. So this has encouraged myself and Yarek Stolarski to go back and conduct a survey of characters, or morphologic characters, um, that can be used in classification that it would be useful in um, classifying fossils and tracing evolutionary patterns through geologic time. Uh, and we've used three approaches to the survey characters. We've been looking at macromorphology, which is the traditional approach using 3D observations uh, with a regular light microscope. We've been using micromorphology, 3D observations made using scanning electron microscopy, and also uh, microstructure, which involves transverse thin sections. These are microscopic thin sections. Um, and also scanning electron microscopy of polished and etched transverse sections. And to better understand patterns of character evolution, we've been mapping character states onto the molecular tree. So the actual topology of this tree is that molecular tree that I showed you earlier. And here are the three main clades, the Pacific II, the Pacific I, and the Atlantic clade. 
And superimposed on this, all these colors are um, the character known as number of septal cycles. And what you can see is that the, the purple or the magenta, whatever color this is, um, these tend to be more basal or primitive. And from this character state, you see um, less than three septal cycles and four or more septal cycles arising, but they arise many, many times suggesting convergent evolution. In other words, the same feature um, is, is evolving in different groups. Um, also in this, you can see uh, measures of, of how well these, this characteristic maps onto the molecular tree, and these include consistency indices and retention indices, which range in values from zero to one, and all of these values are relatively low. A couple of them have potential, but in general, they're relatively low. Okay, another traditional type of character, micromorphologic character, involves corallite budding. Um, here, again, we've mapped um, the states of this character onto the molecular tree. Um, you can have multi-directional budding, bi-directional budding, circumoral budding. Um, and in general, um, you can see that each one of these states has arisen several different times. The, the magenta state and the black state is also um, arisen several times. And not only, or, or essentially, the, these statistics down here are, are better than before, but what you can see from this is that they're not providing any, inf this character is not providing any information about the um, relationships towards the base of the tree. And that's what we're really interested in doing is finding characters that help us with the relationships towards the base of the tree. And so this character is not really very helpful in that respect. Okay, so the new characters involve micromorphology and microstructure. And in conceiving these characters, we are using new models of septal growth. Um, model, biomineralization models have um, advanced tremendously since that old model that I showed you um, earlier in the talk. And now this one is written by, was conceived by Yarick himself. And um, here, these are two different septa. And instead of trabeculae, we have centers of rapid accretion. And within each of these centers are one or more calcification centers arranged in different ways in different taxa. And then surrounding these centers of rapid accretion are thickening deposits. So we've been thinking about um, characters in a much different way in light of these new models of septal growth. And the first set of characters I'll show you are micromorphology. Uh, this is the shapes of teeth and granules along the margins and faces of septa. Each one of these plates here are, is a septa. And what you can see is that this is sponge shaped, these in the Atlantic, and have these spikes coming off the faces of the septa. And the area between the spines is consists of horizontal layers. And different septa have more or less the same types of teeth. By contrast, with the Pacific, we've got more triangular-shaped teeth that are thicker. The granules, in other words, these bumps on the side are, um, are not very prominent. They're rounded knobs, essentially. And in different septa, there are different types of teeth. So if you look very closely, these are two, family, or two groups that were thought to be members of the same family, but now um, the new molecular tree suggests they belong to completely different clades you can see that there are um, distinctive differences between the two. Uh, these differences can be interpreted within um, the context of the uh, model of septal growth I just showed. Uh, here, the main axis of septal growth is um, are these red lines. And the yellow lines are calcification axes that are secondary. These tend to be much more better developed in the Atlantic than in the Pacific. And thickening deposits tend to be much um, better developed in the Pacific. And as a result of the combination of different types of calcification axes and different types of thickening deposits, we have um, different types of teeth expressed in the two groups. OK, so mapping these characters onto the molecular tree, we see um, higher statistics, um, much better agreement. But most importantly, there's more resolution towards the base of the tree. It's still not perfect, but it's closer. OK. So um, we've 
performed a few preliminary analyses using the morphologic, uh, the new morphologic characters. And this is some of the results. Here is a molecular tree, here is a morphologic tree, and here is a combined tree. Um, the molecular tree and the morphologic tree don't disagree in any way. We just have much more resolution in the molecular tree towards the base of the tree and much more resolution in the morphologic tree towards the branch tips. And so that when you combine the two um, approaches and create a combined tree, um, you get a fairly well resolved tree. So the next step is to add fossils. We've done a little bit of that. Um, that's pretty much what I intend to do over the next few years is add more fossils. Um, so here, these are the clades in the, that previous diagram. The red species are recent, the green are Miocene and Pliocene, the blue are Ligocene, and the black are, are Eocene. And just because I'm not sure that everybody knows the age dates for these, Eocene runs from 50, 56 to 34 million years ago, the Oligocene from 34 to 23 million years ago, and the Myopliocene from 23 to two million years ago. And what you can see is that there are essentially four minor clades represented in this um, tree. One of them are clades one, five, and six all have re uh, Eocene representatives contained within them. And clade two also has um, Oligocene. And so what this suggests, and then also we've got these two clades down here, seven and eight, which are, consist mostly of, um, of uh, modern and, and uh, myopliocene taxa, but they are basal to the rest of the tree. This suggests that these subclades within the new Atlantic clade all arose at, during Eocene time at about the same time that the new Atlantic clade itself arose. And we continue to work on this because this, this is, I say, is just a preliminary analysis. So today there are th three kind of biodiversity centers for corals. There's one in uh, Indi Indonesia, there's one out here in the Indian Ocean, and there's one in the Caribbean. And traditional taxonomy suggests that the Pacific and Indian Ocean centers share 100 percent of genera and majority of species but that the Caribbean and Pacific share 70 percent of genera and no species. So in other words, this um, traditional taxonomy suggests that the Caribbean is just a depauperate subset of the Pacific and most of the origination is going on in the Pacific um, and essentially feeding the Caribbean. Our results um, are contrary to that. They suggest that one or more uh, family level clades of exclusively Atlantic corals diverge from a more cosmopolitan tethian fauna pri prior to Middle Eocene time. So here's the Cretaceous, and during the Cretaceous there was a seaway that ran across the globe called the Tethian Seaway, um, and uh, essentially larvae here in the Indian Ocean could move across the Tethys all the way across the Isthmus of Panama. But by the Middle Eocene, the, this connectivity amongst um, all the populations in the area began to split up. And you see the Atlantic Ocean widening, and uh, you see the Tethians starting to close here, in, essentially in the Middle East, and uh, the start of the Isthmus of Panama, although that doesn't close it until a little bit later. Uh, so at this time, uh, here in the Middle Eocene is where we start to see the new Atlantic clade arise and the subclades within it also are arising. Okay, so many subclades within one exclusively Atlantic clade, that's the one I've been talking about, also diverged prior to the Middle Eocene and speciation occurred within these subclades throughout the Cenozoic. One thing I didn't point out in that um, tree that included the fossils is that there are uh, members of many different ages within each of the clades. Okay, and then finally, this is something I haven't had a chance to talk about. Much of the cosmopolitan Tethian fauna became regionally extinct in the Caribbean by Myopliocene time as the Central American Isthmus closed. Okay, so what does this mean for marine conservation? Um, this is a map of uh, marine protected areas. I just recently um, downloaded it. And in this map, you can see that the protected areas are indicated by red and orange blobs and also by these 
blue outlines and green uh, hatch marks. But um, efforts are much more intense in the um, Pacific than they have been in the Caribbean. And part of the reason for this is because of the difference in diversity between the two regions. The Caribbean has more than 700, or the Indo-Pacific has more than 700 species, whereas the Caribbean has about 60 species. So as I say, conservation's efforts have focused on these biodiversity hotspots in, in the Pacific. And what our work suggests that um, not only should these biodiversity hot spots receive special conservation efforts, but also um, those places that are evolutionarily unique, like the Caribbean. So here, although less diverse, Caribbean reef corals do not represent a depauperate subset of a cosmopolitan Indo-Pacific fauna, as indicated by traditional taxonomy. One or more family level Caribbean clades are evolutionarily distinct from the Indo-Pacific corals and diverged more than 50 million years ago. Conservation efforts should be directed at preserving clades, monophyletic groups, in addition to uh, biodiversity hotspots. Okay, so the third part of the talk. This involves the evolution of species. And here, um, our efforts have been concentrated on the Monasteria annularis species complex. And this species complex was long thought to be just one species which had two distinguishing characteristics. One, it had 24 septa, and two, it had two to 3.5 millimeter corallite diameters. So in about the mid-1990s, uh, with the development of different molecular techniques, it was recognized that this one species actually consisted of a complex of three species. Um, the three include Monasteria annularis sensu strictu, which forms columns, uh, Monasteria fabulata, which forms mounds with skirt-like edges, and Monasteria franksi, which forms bumpy mounds. The initial genetic data that were used to distinguish the complex consisted of AFLP nuclear markers. Um, and in these analyses, Monasteria franksi and Monasteria annularis have a diagnostic 920 band, which I think you can see whereas Monasteria fabulata has the 880 band. Um, the differences between Franksi and Annularis are much more subtle. They involve frequency differences in, in genotypes. And in Panama, um, the AAA genotype, uh, Annularis has more of blue as Annularis, red as Franksi, green as fabulata, whereas um, the AA star, um, Franksi has more of. By contrast, in uh, the Bahamas, for AAA and AA star, there's, there's really no di difference. There are um, genetically um, no significant differences. So this suggests that the structure of this species complex is fairly complicated. Um, because of the fact that we as paleontologists never recognized that this was a, a species complex, um, We've once again gone back to the drawing board and rethought our characters. And in this case, we've been using a geometric morphometrics approach to, dis to try to distinguish the three species in the complex. And we've digitized 25 um, landmarks on corallites. These landmarks were selected to emphasize the relief of the septa, essentially the elevation of the septa and the way it goes down into the, the columella and also the structure of the coralite wall. And we've digitized the 3D um, coordinates of these landmarks. We usually digitize six coralites on the top of the colony and six on the side or the edge of the colony. And to do this digitizing, um, we use a reflex microscope, which is a stereo microscope adapted so that a small light spot appears in the field of view. Essentially, there's a motorized stage with the, which the user can uh, move the light spot into the right position and then send the coordinates to the computer. Okay. So um, the next step involves processing the data and usually we use Bookstein size and shape coordinates to process the data. These, in other words, we create lots of different ratios and we use those ratios as variables in statistical analyses. And this particular um, statistical analysis was based on 30 colonies. So these are the 30 colonies. There are 10 of fabulata. These are genetically characterized colonies. 
uh, 10 of Franksi and 10 of Annularis. And what we've done is we've performed a big canonical discriminant analysis in which the colonies form the different groups. And we've um, determined the distances between the colonies and used those distances to perform this cluster analysis. And the cluster analysis shows that the three species are distinct. And um, also that the Monastery Annularis and Monastery of Franksi are, are uh, morphologically more similar, which is similar to the uh, molecular results. In terms of the characteristics that distinguish the three species, you can see that it, from these um, SEM images that it involves the, the relief of the septa. Uh, Favulata has higher relief, shorter extensions of the septa. A frank's eye has lower relief, um, longer extensions to the septa, and annularis is somewhere in between, but closer to um, frank's eye. OK, this is another analysis. I have lots and lots of discriminant analysis to show you with regard to species problem. And in this particular analysis, the polygons represent the species in Panama. And each one of the points represents a colony. And you can see that annularis is down here. Frank's eye is there. They're overlapping a little bit. And um, favulata is over here. And these dotted polygons, those indicate the three species in the Bahamas. Uh, and from this, you can see that they're overlapping in intermediary, which um, suggests hybridization is going on in the Bahamas in agreement with the molecular results that I showed earlier. So the big question is, could hybridization be occurring? And um, to address this question, my colleagues have perform performed a series of lab experiments in which they've crossed um, favulata and annularis. And the re resulting offspring, the larvae, um, have are a double band, their heterozygous, suggesting that um, they are hybrids. However, when you go out in the field and look for these hybrids, um, none can be found in favulata or, or franksi. And many of the colonies, 10%, a little less than 10% of annularis, appear to be hybrids. But when you look at um, other loci, their strong frequency differences. So my colleagues that are working on the molecular data um, think that hybridization is not occurring today. Okay, so this has led us to say, well, could it have been occurring in the geologic past? And to address this question, um, we have been going around the Caribbean to different islands and collecting uh, Montastria on the terraces that occur along the islands. And here we are. This is the 125,000-year-old terrace. I think this is an Andros Island in the Bahamas. And we've been co making collections along transect lines. And in the, co in the collections are organ type, pipe types of Montastria, columnar types of Montastria, mound-shaped types of, of Montastria. In other words, the same sorts of colony shapes um, that I showed you before underwater. But now, of course, we've got them in the fossil records. So they're a little bit mangled looking. OK, so you can't work with um, colony surfaces when you work with these sorts of colonies. So instead of uh, work looking at colony surfaces, but we've been working with um, transverse thin sections. These are microscopic slides that have been cut through the colony as close as we can get to the surface. And then we've been digitizing um, the coordinates at this time of 27 landmarks. Again, six from the top and six from the side. That is, if we could get them, because sometimes it's hard to to get the, all of them on fossil corals. And here's some of the results. The shaded polygons are the modern species in Panama. So this is Monastery of Franksi, and this is Monastery of Favulata as it is in Panama today, and this is Monastery of Annularis as it is in Panama today. And these other polygons are um, the three species in the fossil record of the Bahamas. And notice that once again, they are um, intermediary and overlapping, suggesting that hybridization was occurring back in the Pleistocene, not only today. OK. So how wide is this hybridization? We do, I'm going to show you results of other Caribbean islands to address that. Uh, first, I'll show you Dominican Republic. And this is the same terrace in the Pleistocene as 
the Bahamas. This is the 125 Terrace in the Dominican Republic. And here there are four morphs. And um, there's a, a overlap between the organ pipe and the columns and the organ pipe and the massives. But they are, they, there is not as much overlap as you see in the Bahamas where it's really extensive. Um, this is the modern, uh, modern collections from Belize. And here you can see the three different um, species with uh, the X's are a frank side, the um, dots are annularis, those being much more closely related than um, fabulata. And at the bottom here it says, the Pleistocene Dominican Republic and modern Belize morphotypes match the modern species in Panama, but they do not match the uh, Bahamas Pleistocene morphotypes. Okay, so this is a map of the distribution of the complex. And this funny looking thing sticking out there, that's going to um, uh, Bermuda, and we haven't sampled there. But anyway, I've shown you Bahamas, and there we were looking at the 125 Terrace. I've shown you um, the south coast of the Dominican Republic, which again, we were looking at the 125 Terrace. I've shown you the modern of Belize and the modern of Panama. Um, and right now, the Bahamas is really different from everything else, and so we decided to pick another location that was on the margin of the distribution in this next um, location is Barbados, which is down south. And Barbados is unusual because there are numerous terraces. The island is going up. And this is a map showing the various terraces. There is an 82,000 year old terrace, a 105 year old terrace, a 125,000 year old terrace, a 200,000 year old terrace, 320, 450, 640, and so on. So what we did is we sampled um, the 125, the 320, and the 640. And here are lots of discriminant plots. Here's Bahamas, just for reference. Here is Barbados at 125, so the same age as Bahamas. Here's an older in Barbados, and there is um, more than 5,000 year old terrace in Barbados. The modern species here are all in red, um, Franksi, Fabulata, Annularis, and so on. And the new species, or the species that we found um, within each one of these terraces are indicated in blue. In the old Barbados Terrace, we found, found columns and plates and massives and platy massives and, and so on. And so he, over here are the summary of our results. The fossil morphotypes within each terrace are distinct. Yeah. Distances between fossil morphotypes are greater than between the modern species. You can kind of see that, but I'll show you that even better in the next slide. Only one of the fossil morphotypes within each terrace actually matches a modern species. Sometimes it looks like they match, but it's because I've only shown you um, a few of the canonical variants, and there are many of them to be taken into consideration. And then finally, when you throw all of these fossil morphotypes into one big analysis, um, the morphotypes in different terraces do not match each other. So each one of these morphotypes is different from the morphotypes that we found in the other terrace. So this suggests to us that speciation is occurring in Barbados. Lots of um, small speciation events. Okay. So the last um, kind of slide about this. Essentially, the next step is we took all of our species and morphotypes and threw them into one big analysis. We had the four species from the Barbados 500 terrace, the four species from the Barbados 300, uh, four from 120, Barbados 125, three from Caymans 125, uh, three from, or four from Dominican Republic 125, three from Florida 125, then the Bahamas 125, then Belize and Panama recent. And we put them in one analysis and we looked at the distances between the species. And what you can see from this is that these are distances between pairs of species within that terrace. And the distances tend to be much higher in Barbados than they do anywhere else, especially compared to the recent. Meanwhile, the distances in the Bahamas are much lower than anywhere else. So it suggests that something different is happening in these marginal locations. That is, the Bahamas, where we think there's hybridization going on, and Barbados, where we think there's speciation going on. And meanwhile, in these more central localities, 
not much is happening. Um, so stasis in the center, these central localities tend to match the modern day situation. Uh, they're a little bit lower, but it's not stati statistically significant um, than the recent location. So we've got stasis in the center and we've got um, unusual evolutionary events happening on the margins. Uh, interestingly, current patterns f flow through the Caribbean in this direction. So they start with Barbados and then they move through the Caribbean and um, then they end up in the Bahamas and this ending up in the Bahamas during the Pleistocene would have been uh, much more difficult than today because um, the Bahamas were more isolated during the Pleistocene. Okay, so evolutionary novelty is concentrated at the edge of coral species distributions. Speciation occurs in source population hybridization and sink populations and the conservation implications in addition to biodiversity hotspots conservation efforts should focus on areas of high evolutionary potential. So both in terms of our analysis of overall clades within the Atlantic and also within species complexes, we find that um, there are certain areas where there's high evolutionary potential and they do not necessarily correspond with biodiversity hotspots. So that in uh, determining where marine uh, reserves should be placed, uh, these evolutionary hotspots should be uh, taken into consideration. So thank you. Thank you.